WFLA. Well, hi there, fun seekers. How are you this afternoon? Oh, oh. I mean, have I got a problem or have I got a problem? The problem is my entire show this afternoon is based upon a newspaper clipping, a newspaper column that was sent to me a day or so ago from a listener. And I'm all ready to go with the show. The problem is I left the column at home and you guys ain't read it, so you don't know what it's all about. Oh, merciful me, what a, what a quandary, what a quandary. But hey, it's just, it is the least of the quandaries facing me this day. However... It's neither here nor there. We shall, we shall do our absolute best. Okay, this is, this is the situation. I got a letter the other day from someone whose name I couldn't really read, uh, you know, so that, that doesn't make too much difference. And he started off the letter by saying that, but, well, you know, it, it was apparent I had, uh, you know, I cleaned up a lot of sex talk. Never talk about sex. I've done one show on sex, I, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, since I came to this town. And that, uh, you know, I wasn't using them filthy four-letter words. I never used filthy four-letter words. Only words like damn and hell. And, well, it's not four letters, Mike. I think that's nine. And uh, it, it also said uh, said that, uh, you know, but I was still very rude and, and crude and abrasive to people, to most people. And then the last letter, or the last line of the letter, said, and on top of that, I didn't know anything at all about economics. See the enclosed column. Well, the enclosed column was written by, I think the guy's name was Charlie Rice or something like that, who was obviously a right-wing Neanderthal, who was a, uh, you know, useful idiot for the big guys. And Charlie went on to say that, in, in essence, that all of this, all of this minimum wage talk, please, it's not a minimum wage show, don't, 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 get, don't get scared. All of this minimum wage talk was just so unnecessary because, first of all, it was very bad for the country, and besides the whole thing, the whole thing was... was the unions were behind it all. That it was the unions that were after an increase in the minimum wage. And he had some marvelous logic that I'll get into. And that on top of that, uh, any, you know, an, anybody could see that all of the problems in this country were directly related to the workers. And he cited several things. He cited, for example, you know, you can go into those department stores uh, that take up acres and acres and acres, and you won't see one sales clerk because all the people that work there are cashiers. They're the only people that work there, and they're usually down at the front of the store. And there's no sales help. And that's because of organized labor, and it's because workers in this country just don't appreciate their good jobs, so they, the good, fine folks who own stores were forced into doing things like that, and that, in essence, people who work for a living should keep their damn mouths shut. Well, Mr. So-and-so, whoever you are that sent me the column, I read through the column, as I hope I have demonstrated to you and to the other members of the audience, and gosh, golly gum, I, I, I don't really know. You say I'm, I'm, I'm poorly educated in economics, and after reading through that column, my eyes have been opened, sir. Indeed, my eyes, as we speak right here behind the microphone, have been opened. Clearly, the problem is labor, organized and unorganized. That is obviously what is wrong with this country. How could I have ever missed that? The logic in the column was absolutely flawless. I mean, it was pointed out that those big department stores no longer have clerks. And that is true. But I thought that the clerks were eliminated not because they cost too much, but simply because they cost. Period. However, I note that management teams haven't been reduced, nor has their cut, or their pay been cut. But I guess that's, you know, it's... it's if you'll please excuse me, it's the, it's the 1960 child in me that, that makes me think that way. It was also pointed out that the poor little businessman in this country, the poor, poor little businessman, had to compete with those big, god-awful corporations, and therefore he needed help. The poor little businessman in this country needed help against those big corporations, and the help should be keeping the minimum wage where it is so that he can hire people and won't have to pay them very much. That help is in the form of asking working slobs to offer their services at less money than it costs to live. And we should, feel, we should feel very badly for the small businessman in this country because he's up against the corporations, and therefore working people should offer to work for less than it costs to live. Now, I sat there, skeptic that I am, you know, and, and, and I promise you my eyes have been opened on this one. I sat there and I said, what? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, if that's the problem... 
Why, why not ask the ultra-rich, nasty corporations to make sacrifices, not the poor working stiff? And then I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, I must be wrong. You know, that, that must be some kind of lunatic thinking. Yeah, yeah, I must be wrong in that. Well, it was also pointed out in the column that it was the poor consumer who would only end up having to bear the burden. Ah, Dan! Well, there's the argument right there. It's the poor consumer that's going to have to end up paying for all of this. And then I thought, well, wait a second. I thought the guy who works for a living was the consumer. And if, 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 if the guy working for the living is the consumer, then, then who are these, these other people that, that own the places and, and, and hold the stock and, and are the managers and such and get big salaries? What are they? It was pointed out that a lot of people would lose their jobs if the minimum wage was increased. Well, I, you know, gosh, I talked to you about that one before, but then it dawned to me, guys like, like the guy that wrote the column and, and the president and, the, you know, the other president, and they're always telling me that hardly anybody earns the minimum wage anyway. So how could that many people lose their jobs if nobody was getting it? I mean, you can't, you can't eliminate a job that doesn't exist, can you? I mean, if nobody's getting the minimum wage, except for a couple of kids, you know, basically cutting the lawns in the suburbs, how, how could all those minimum wage people that don't exist lose their jobs? It was also pointed out that the unions... Whoa, there's the U word, Michael. Bet we'll get a lot of calls on that one, huh? If that doesn't work, I'll say Carolyn from Newport Ritchie. That'll get us calls. But anyway, it was also pointed out that the unions used the minimum wage as a bargaining chip. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Those guys in Detroit earning thirty-five, forty, fifty thousand dollars an hour. Go in and talk to Henry Ford and say, Henry, I want a hundred thousand dollars an hour because the minimum wage is three dollars and thirty-five cents. And Henry says, whoa, I didn't know that. I'll give you $200,000 an hour. No, I, you see again, here, here is where I, I'm wrong. I guess. <clears throat> you see, when I bargain for my wages, I point out how much management gets. Not how little the pay is at the hamburger place. I mean, when I went in and I said, you know, look, I want X number of dollars a, a year because so-and-so does this and such-and-such such does that, and you're doing such-and-such. Such. And I guess I should have gone in and said, I want X number of dollars a year because McDonald's only pays $3.50 an hour. Now, that kind of logic would have probably made David Medeseco's pants fall off and just caused him on the spot to take out his checkbook. I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm just... You know... You know, it seems to me that the only people who earn a decent living in this country, the only decent working wages in this country, are for people who belong to unions. And I should think it would be to their credit that they champion the cause of the little guy. Because they seem to be the only ones who do. They seem to be the only organized group of people who do care. And if there's anybody out there so stupid, if there's anybody out there so pig-headed as to think that the union goes in and says, well, you know, the minimum wage is uh, $3.50 an hour, so I think our highly skilled uh, people getting uh, $22 an hour should get 23 If there's anybody out there so stupid, please, please stand by the radio because th there's even more coming for you. But like, like the guy said who wrote me the letter, I, I don't understand economics. He said that I, I was ignorant and, and didn't understand economics and... Well, I'll tell you what I do understand, Mr. Letter Writer, if you're out there, and I suspect that you might be. And if you're not, there are an awful lot of other people out there who think just like you do. So let me tell you what I do understand. I do understand that the clerks who used to work at that department store you were talking about, the clerks whose jobs were eliminated, they are no longer consumers. So in order to attract new customers, that department store started to sell cheaper foreign-made merchandise. And that created still fewer consumers because the people that used to make the American goods, they no longer work either. And it also added to the trade imbalance, which drove up interest rates, making it harder for people to buy things on credit, like, oh, I don't know, some of those big ticket items that you sell at the department stores. 
So in order to be able to make such purchases more attractive to consumers, the department stores cut the wages of the cashiers. That, you know, the only people that are left. The problem is that the cashiers no longer can afford to shop at the department store anymore. But, with the help of the bean counters, the management team finagled the books a little bit this quarter to make it look like they had a great quarter, and so they issued themselves big bonuses. And in order to make sure that they got big bonuses next quarter, they figured, well, if we can cut costs a little bit more. So they eliminated two of the cashiers. And you can stand in line longer now. The article went on to point out that giving a decent wage to a working man adds nothing to the economy. It said that this was really some wild, convoluted thinking. I, I wish that I had the article in front of me. God, how I wish I did. But it said that something, something to the effect of that you can't create wealth by giving people more money if they are working people. But somehow you could create wealth by giving rich people more money. Uh, I guess that implies that higher wages and increased dividends are okay for w rich people. I mean, isn't it strange that, that putting $100 into the pocket of a guy wearing overalls is bad for the economy, but if you put the same $100 into a pocket in a three-piece suit, it's good. I, I never could understand that. I never could understand that at all. That, that's very bizarre logic to me. I mean, 100 bucks into the economy is 100 bucks into the economy, I thought. But there are some people who have hundreds of dollars already in their pockets, to think it's much, much, much smarter to put more money in their pocket and not put any in yours. Because, well, I don't know, I guess their, their money's better than your money. It, it, the article pointed out that, that these low-paying jobs are basically entry-level jobs anyway. And small businesses, we all remember the small businessman. You know, he's, he's under siege from the large corporation. So in Instead of, of doing something to make the large corporations stop beating up on the small businessman, you're supposed to work for the small businessman for virtually nothing. So you remember those entry-level jobs anyway, and the small businessman. I don't know too many people who start out as minimum wage, entry-level people, and end up working in the executive suite. Do you? Do you want to know why that happens? It's easy. It's because guys who make the big bucks tend to look down their noses on common working people. You see, we teach them to do that in our business schools, and we, we reinforce it when they come to work for us. Let me tell you a little story. It's very, very, very brief. It's a true story, too. It's an old one. It goes back 20, 25 years. But I'll bet you, Nickel, that a lot of companies still operate this way. I had a friend. Talk about limousine liberal. This guy was a limousine liberal. His parents were very, very wealthy. And he was a pretty liberal kind of guy, but the time came when he had to go to work. I mean, his parents had sent him to the big schools, and he had the diplomas and all that kind of stuff, and he finally had to go to work, and so he got a job with a large mail order company in Philadelphia. And he had a three-day orientation. He was a management trainee, and he had a three-day orientation. His job was to be just walking up and down the floor, in the department where the mail came in and was sorted. And this was a very, very large company. So we're talking about hundreds of people all day long, 24 hours a day, sorting mail. And his job was just to basically walk up and down the floor and make sure that they kept working. He didn't know what they were doing. Nobody cared that he didn't know what they were doing. That wasn't his job. During his three-day orientation, he was told, and this is the truth, to never smile. He was told if he must, he could just have no expression at all, but they would, they would really prefer that he walk up and down the aisle with a frown on. Most companies actually have policy directives on how to deal with labor, how to stay aloof, how to avoid getting involved, how to hold down their wages. I know of not one company I would be delighted if you do to correct me here, but I know of not one company that has a policy director for holding down the compensation of its top management. 
They just have policies for holding down the compensation of the lowest paid people. Because there are different class of people. That's why people don't start out in entry-level positions and make it to executive suites. They're not considered to be the same kind of people. When Dixie is your wife... I don't know how to explain this. I was sent a column and a letter by a, a listener recently, but I left the column home, so I can't read the column to you, and I just kind of have to basically tell you what it said. And the letter said that I was dumb and stupid and didn't know anything at all about economics, and I, I was you know, sitting here saying I probably don't because these are the way that seems that most of you people see things, and it's the way I see them, and, and I, I must be wrong. I mean, for example, I am told that it is necessary by this crowd, this, this crowd that doesn't want anybody to get a wage increase except those who already make a lot of money. I am told that it is necessary to, play, to pay, rather, a training wage, or what amounts to a sub-minimum wage, you know, God forbid we should raise the minimum wage, for up to six months. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, I guess that makes sense. You know, the small businessman has to train people, uh, and so he should be able to pay them a dollar or two less an hour. But I, I am also told that these jobs, you know, the ones that pay minimum wage, they pay so little because they require no skill. Huh? Uh, that, that doesn't make a great deal of sense to me, you know. I, let, let me see if we can't walk through this one again together, and maybe it'll make sense to me. Um... Employers should be able to pay less than the minimum wage for six months so that they can train people to do jobs that pay so little because they're unskilled and don't require any skill to do. Well, I, it, it just must be me. I suppose it's me. It's probably the brand of coffee or something that I drink. You, sir, who sent me the, the column, you, sir, who sent me the letter, are nothing more than a useful idiot for the guys with a big buck. And you're trying to tell me, sir, that I do not understand economics? Working-class stiffs in this country, sir, tend to drive American-made cars. Yuppies, who tend to set the wages of working-class stiffs, tend to drive foreign-made cars. Working-class stiffs tend to vacation in places like Disneyland and Atlantic City, and they tend to drink domestic beer. Yuppies tend to vacation in Europe and drink bottled water from France. And I don't understand economics, sir. The average wage around these parts, good old Hillsborough, Pinellas County, is around 14 something a year. Not very far from the minimum wage. I guess there must be an awful lot of entry-level jobs in the area, huh, sir? I mean, it has to be that way, but... But it seems to me that if there are so many entry-level jobs, then there must be a lot of non-entry-level jobs. Because, you know, an entry-level job implies that you work there for a little bit, and then you move up to the big bucks. Why, why isn't the average wage higher then? I guess it's because there aren't just entry-level jobs. And these aren't just entry-level jobs. That's all there is, folks. Why is it that some people resent a wage increase for a low-paid guy? I will never understand that. I will never, ever understand that, but have absolutely no problem with wage increases for people who are already well-paid. I, you know, again, I, 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 whoa, I don't understand. And why is it that an increase for a relatively small number of people, remember, the hard, hardly anybody at all earns this money? Why is it that a, an increase for a relatively small number of people will break the back of the economy and be borne by the poor consumer? Oh, my God! The consumer's got to pay again for this? But an increase for somebody who's already well-paid somehow does not have the same effect. Now, let me see if I understand this correct. If a guy is getting $4 an hour, he gets a raise to $4.25 an hour... I, the consumer, have to pay for it. But if some guy who's running a business for somebody else is getting $100,000 a year and gets an increase to $150,000 a year, I don't have to pay for it. Huh. It would seem to me the answer to this entire problem is to pay everybody $100,000 a year. That is clearly the answer. It is argued that if you increase the wages of low-paid people, that their increases will be lost to higher prices caused by the increase. But how come that theory is never involved when already well-paid people get increases? I mean, for example, it is argued that if you raise the minimum wage to 4.55 an hour, whatever it is, it will be instantly gobbled up by unscrupulous landlords 
increases in food and gasoline prices, not to mention Gucci loafers, and that the poor people getting the minimum wage will actually be in worse shape than they are now. Hmm. Let's see if this makes any sense. We are told by our government that somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 to 5% of the workers in this country get the minimum wage. Okay. That's, let's round it off. We'll make it real easy. That's 5% of the people get the minimum wage. If we give these people a dollar an hour increase, no, that's too much. Let's spread it out. Let's make it about 30 cents an hour for the first year. That's $12, okay? Yeah, we'll give them 12 bucks because we don't want to ruin the economy. So we'll give them 12 bucks a week, and somehow that's going to cause inflation. Inflation's so bad that it's going to gobble up. And the inflation would have to be in, in excess of 10% a year to gobble up their increase. However, the other 95% of the people who do not get the minimum wage will probably get about a $20 a week increase this year. Eh, average out. Some people get 7 some people get 36 You know, 20 bucks a year. 20 bucks a week, rather. And that won't cause inflation. That will not cause the people earning $3.35 an hour to have their wages eaten up. And I don't understand economics. It was argued in this article that if you pass the money on to the working stiff, it would somehow result in no new capital. There wouldn't be any new wealth created if you just gave workers a raise instead of allowing the owners and the managers to keep the money. Well, let's see again if I can understand this one. I mean, this, you know, this economic stuff, boy, it is really complicated. Let's see. If I have, let's say I have a billion dollars on the table, Okay. Got a great big pile of money, you know, like, like they do with the, in the Florida jackpot commercials. A billion dollars right here on my table. And if, if I give that money to the rich, it somehow becomes new capital. But if I give it to the workers, it somehow disappears. Hmm. Just, just disappears into nothingness. But if I give it to the rich, it, it's new money. And it's new wealth. If I, if I well, let's see if we can't walk through this. The way I understand it is that if the working stiff would use his money to buy beer and a new house. He would be creating new jobs and the need for new industry, you know, a larger brewery. But if you give it to the rich guy, he's likely to buy a Mercedes and Gucci loafers. Now, one group is creating wealth. The other group is exporting it. Can you tell which group is which? Guess I'm just dumb, huh? Seems to me, again, dear letter writer, that you're starting to look more and more like a useful idiot for the crowd that says a dollar in their pockets is better than a dollar in your pocket. Frankly, sir, I am stunned at what I read in this column that you sent me. I'm stunned that it isn't labeled satire. And I'm even more stunned that you didn't hurt yourself when you were clipping it out. At least I'm going to assume that you didn't hurt yourself because I don't see any blood on it, but, you know, hey, maybe I'm assuming too much, you know what I mean? There you are, a dupe. You're a dupe for the people who have set working-class Americans against one another. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're a dupe for a group of people so short-sighted, so greedy, that they would literally destroy this country and eat the seed and destroy the backbone of this country. People like yourself, sir, who go out and work for a living. I mean, isn't it amazing that this country grew strong and grew rich when living wages prevailed all over the place? And now it's in a struggle for its economic life with Japan because some people can only see wealth at the expense of earning it off of some poor slobs and hard labor. You know, Henry Ford... You remember Henry Ford? God, Henry Ford used to make all kinds of money back when people were paid living wages. Henry had a better idea. Henry paid his employees so well that they became his customers. And when things got slow, he kept them on. He took money out of his own pocket to do so. And pretty soon, they bought new cars and things picked up and Henry became a very, very wealthy man and his employees led good lives. Today, when things get slow, well, the guy who has the bucks, he dismisses his employees. And then he farms out the work that they used to do to foreign nations so he can you know, squeeze a couple more bucks here and there. And then when nobody can afford to buy his goods, his new products, he wonders why. 
You must be right, sir. I do not understand economics. Not economics like yours. Not economics like these. But, 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 but. There is another kind of economics that I also wanted to talk to you about today. It has nothing whatsoever to do with this stuff. But it's economics. Economics that I apparently do understand, do not understand. It's a letter to the editor in the St. Petersburg Times this morning. And this has nothing to do with anything I just talked about. And yet it's all the same thing. So let me share it with you. This one I remembered to bring. Dear Editor, who will pay the cost of AIDS? It's, it's about the, an article here called Who Will Pay the Cost of AIDS. After reading the eye-opening and obviously well-researched May 23rd articles on AIDS by Bob Port, my blood is boiling. I do not feel sorry for people who, though, no, excuse me, I do indeed feel sorry for people who, through no fault of their own, are suffering from AIDS, i.e. babies born to drug-addicted mothers, hospital patients who, who contract AIDS from blood transfusions, etc. All available medical assistance and comfort should be given to those unfortunates. But just once, I'd like to see someone write an article from the taxpayer's point of view. Now, <clears throat> uh, the taxpayer can usually be... You, you can usually, you know, that's interchangeable with consumer. Okay, that, that's how this kind of ties in. From the taxpayer's point of view, we who ultimately pay for the casual sex and the infected needles that result in AIDS, let people choose whatever lifestyle turns them on. Ah, uh, this must be one of those liberal people who says, you know, let people choose whatever lifestyle turns them on. But don't make me pay for the consequences. While these people are initially enjoying their way of living, I and millions of other taxpayers shell out higher insurance premiums. Huh? I didn't know insurance premiums had anything to do with tax paying, but oh well. Uh, where were we? Premiums then contribute, according to the figures in Mr. Port's article, to the $80,000 lifetime cost of medical care per AIDS patient. Hospitals are saddled with millions of dollars in unreimbursed care. Medical and Social Security disability income are threatened by the number of applications due to AIDS. Cannot the gay community... Uh, this is the part I really love. Cannot the gay community contribute to an insurance fund to take care of its own self-inflicted problems? That I would... That I'd love to see how they're going to work that one out. I, I suppose you would have to come forward and declare that you were gay and make a contribution or something, or, or perhaps be assessed. You know, oh, I can't just see it now. People from City Hall coming around. Open up! Open up there! Are you gay or straight? Oh, oh I'm, I'm gay. Oh, I'm going to have to assess you $200. Well, I go both ways. Okay, just 100 then. Anyway, go back to this. Where does all the illegal money go that is... You think I'm getting off the track here. Where does all the illegal money go that is seized in drug raids? Cannot this be used to defray the cost of treatment for drug addicts, for AIDS patients? Michael Condren, president of AIDS Coalition Pinellas, is angered by the lack of health care for people with AIDS and says, we still have the it's not my problem problem. He's right. The lack of health care for people who willfully abuse their bodies quite simply is not my problem. You created the problem? You solved the problem. That letter was written by Janet A. Sonderland of Spring Hill. Anybody that knows Janet may want to avoid her in the future. You see... You see... Uh, Darn if that column doesn't make sense. Of course, it would make sense if all the people who, who wanted to eat red meat and got hardening of the arteries also paid for their individual care. Uh, I'd like to register down here at City Hall. I'm a red meat eater. Uh, where do I contribute for uh, people who have a hardening of the arter arteries? Or if all of the people who smoked contributed to their health care, or if all the people who drank, or if all the people who jogged. I wonder how much money a year we spend in this country with jogger's foot and jogger's knee and, and jogger's whatever. I think it's disgusting. Those people willfully go out there and run. Hey, look, I'm not trying to tell you how to lead your life. If you want to be a runner, you go run. But don't ask me to pay for it. Or, you know, if all the people who drove cars and got into accidents or got fat. Oh, there's a lot of, oh, my God, how much money fat people cost this country every year. People who willfully shove food into their mouths long, long beyond the point of what they need. People who sit there and read in low light, who deliberately 
Read in low light to the point where they can't see and need glasses. Many of whom can't afford glasses, and I end up paying for it through higher insurance premiums and higher taxes. People who drink too much soda pop and get cavities. Willfully. Hey, what are you going to ask me? You want to drink soda pop? You go ahead and drink soda pop. But don't ask me to pay for your damn cavities. I had nothing to do with it. But all these people are doing their own thing, you know? Hey, choosing their own lifestyle. I'm not here to rain on your parade. You can choose your own lifestyle. I mean, hey, you want to drink soda pop and get cavities? You want to you, you be a gay homosexual and get AIDS? You're not going to ask me to pay for it, are you? What about all those Alzheimer's patients who deliberately chose to cook in aluminum? Ah, they could have cooked in cast iron. They could have cooked in... They, 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 they could have cooked in stainless steel. They could have cooked... They, they, they could have cooked in copper, but no. They wanted to cook in aluminum. I mean, I went out of my way to buy cookware so as not to become a burden on society. I went out of my way to buy cookware that's not going to give me Alzheimer's disease. You don't give a damn. Nah, you still cook in aluminum, but you want me to pay for it when you go bonkers when you're 70. I'm still going to have all of my, you know, faculties because I don't cook in aluminum. You're going to be walking around saying, is it shoe or is it Thursday? And who has to pay for this? Me! I say none for all, or all for none. Are you guys with me or not? I want you to go over to the window. I want you to open Go over to the window. Open it up right now. Stick your head out there and you say, I'm happy as hell, and I don't, just don't care about anybody else. Go on. Open up the window. I'm happy as hell, and I don't care about anybody else. God, doesn't that feel good? Excuse me. Over. I don't have a window that opens. Let's open up a door here. I'm happy as hell and I don't care about anybody else. Oh, God, that felt good. Go on, Michael, do it. Do it. Michael, go over there and open the door. Yeah. Your, your, your chicken, your chicken, you know what, Michael? <sighs> Where was I? <sighs> you know, I recently ended a show. Actually, I recently ended two shows by saying, Ah, to hell with you! And I got several people, not on the air, off the air, who commented about that, saying, Whoa, well, God. Hey, why not? Why in the hell should I be any different? I mean, wh wh what do you guys expect of me and Harris and, and Cleveland Wheeler and, 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 you know, John Rock and Roll Anthony? Hey, have a great day. Isn't like, Nah, to hell with you! Come on, that's what you say about me all the time. Why can't I say it back to you? Uh, last year was in a foul mood today. He didn't give me a good free show to hell with him. Ah, to hell with you too. You didn't give me a good call. Come on, go over to the window and I'm happy as hell, and I don't give a damn about the rest of you. Oh. Whew. <sighs> Makes me feel better. Age, maids, wages, blazes, eh? Whoever for the stamps to be in there. He didn't ask me to write back to him. Hell, he didn't give me his address. Wish he had. I mean, we would have gone over and kicked the doors in his car and let the air out of his tires. But it suddenly dawns on me. This jerk is so happy. I mean, he's in such a snit to write me a letter. He tears off one stamp from a block of four, puts it on the front of the envelope, and puts the other three stamps inside the envelope. Thank you very much, sir. By the way, we used it to pay the bills with this month. Hey, but I'm a reasonable man. I am a very, very reasonable man. A man who has turned over, of course, a new leaf. A man who is here to not argue with you. Just to make you look like a fool. I'm not here to hang up on you. I'm here to hang you. It's my new leaf. And I don't want you to have to mail your stamps to me. I don't want you to get so excited that you put your stamps in the envelope... Because I know that most of you are probably earning the minimum wage and the 75 cents really hurts. And I don't need it that bad, thank you. Although any of you who do want to send me 75 cents are, you know, either in stamp or coin, are encouraged to do so. I don't take checks. 
But in any event, I thought, you know, maybe you'd like to point out my stupidity to me because obviously after I read that column, I can certainly see where I was wrong. And maybe, you know, maybe you can explain some of the thinking behind that column or thinking behind anything, any column that you're behind. Maybe, you know, you could tell me why it's only labor who seems to be organized labor. Who seems to be behind increasing the minimum wage. Or maybe you could talk about AIDS and how, how you know, we ought to kill the faggots or, or anything in between. I should think that this column and even this monologue would make you very angry because you're a group of people who don't like to be blamed for anything. And if you earn, I guess it's under 20 grand a year, you are being blamed for all of the economic problems in this country. None of it has anything to do with incompetent management. None of it has anything whatsoever to do with incompetent mid-management. None of it has anything whatsoever to do with anything except those poor bastards who are getting just a couple of bucks an hour and want more. It's their fault. And I would wonder if, you know, maybe you'd agree with that, maybe you wouldn't. Or maybe you'd just like to point out my stupidity on this or any other possible subject matter. As the, the gentleman who, who wrote me and sent me the column and apparently did not hurt himself while clipping it out, which still amazes me. I can't... Be, maybe not. We were thinking about maybe you got a next-door neighbor to do it because we just, you know, couldn't... There was no blood on it whatsoever. 3.49 and one-half the time. Standing by with a WFLA News Palace. Let's go to the telephones. Clear water. Hi, Clear. You're on the air at 970 WFLA. Uh, hello, Clear. Uh, clear. Uh, hello, Clear. Oh, pity poo. Clearwater couldn't hold on. Clearwater becomes the newest member of the Dog Meat Club. You surely wouldn't want that ad to happen to you, would you? St. Petersburg. St. You're on the air at 970 WFLA. Boring show, Bob, I like to say. Uh, okay, that's the only call we got. <laughs> What a bunch of geeks you guys are. <laughs> oh, well. No, you guys are going to call in. You're not going to call in. I, you know, I don't believe in sitting here and entertaining you when you're supposed to be on the phone. I just don't believe. You know, I, I did my best with a 50-minute monologue. Damn good monologue, too, if you, you know, don't mind me saying so. And some poor slob sits there for 24, 25 minutes so he can, you know... Hear himself on the radio. It's the only way he's going to ever hear himself on the radio. Jim in St. Petersburg Beach. Hi there, Jim. How are you doing? Is this oh, the, great. Is this the new Lassiter? No, sir. This is magnificent Lassiter. Oh, I thought maybe you'd been taking your Bernard Melchel pills or something. Mm, sir, 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 sir. Um, Please, there's nobody better than I am. Don't, 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 don't put me I in agree. a category with an old hack. No. Now, is he still on any place? Probably somewhere. Yeah. You know about TK and e -N -D, one of those stations. Well, I don't hear him down here. Oh. Well, anyway. That's okay. Nobody hears those stations either. <laughs> The, uh, there is a theory behind what this guy that wrote you was talking about, you know, paying the wealthy more and the uh, poor people less. Yes, I know it's called trickle-down economics. It was exactly. tried in the 1920s and again in the early 1980s. That's right. It's that the idea is, by the way, I'm for, I'm for raising the minimum wage. I'm just trying to explain what, what, it, what the idea is anyway, that wealthy people, when they get excess money, tend to invest it, whatever that means. Well, it means they tend to speculate amongst each other in pieces of paper on the New York right. Stock Exchange. Exactly. That's not investing. That's speculating amongst themselves. And poor people, like you say, tend to spend it on what they need. In the early 1980s, there was a phenomenon in this country. There were two young whiz kids. Actually, it was the late 1970s, but it really caught on in the early 1980s. There were two young whiz kids who lived out in California who built a computer in their garage. And they started a company called the Apple Computer Company, and it started literally a revelation, a revelation, a revolution in personal computers that other companies also caught on to. And these two kids became very, very, very wealthy, and their company became very, very, very big. And yes. a lot of people have Apple computers, and I'm now on my second one. Unfortunately, my second one was built overseas. Is that, that right? And that pisses me off to no end. Yeah. I am well, livid about that. I did not Silicon, realize it. Silicon Valley has just about turned into a ghost town. Yeah, and now there are an awful lot of people who used to build Apple computers that no longer can afford to buy them. That's right. I think the key index, though, uh, Bob, is not so much, you know, who's getting paid what. What you're, what you're, I think you're really talking about is equity and fairness. No, and, I'm talking about common sense. Yeah, and what uh, the kind of numbers I think we all ought to look at is has to do with what usually is referred to as the distribution of wealth in this country. There well, that's exactly what the gentleman was talking about on the column. I wish I had the column to read you. He just wanted to redistribute it at the top. Well, you know, starting with 
the New Deal, and perhaps a little before that, um, we decided as a country to take some wealth out of the hands of the 10% that own 90% and redistribute it a little bit. That was a, a virtually an announced social policy. You say, well, I don't, I don't want to take any wealth out of anybody's hands. Well, I, I you, don't don't, to, you don't literally don't take, take it. Well, I'm sorry. There are a lot of people that would love to. I'm not one of them. I, I would like the wealthiest 10% to be smart enough to redistribute it themselves so they can get wealthier still. But in recent years, the trend has gone back the other way. I think that's the most telling fact that uh, means something to me, that we're, this economy is not serving the people anymore. Well, there's another thing that I find very telling that bothers me very, very, very much. I'm not an overly intelligent man. I don't mind telling you that, and I think that anybody that listens to me is very well aware of that. I don't pretend to have any great uh, education. I have virtually none, thank you. But I'm awfully sick and tired of being played for a fool. I'm awfully sick and tired of being told that a dollar in a rich man's pocket is better than a dollar in a poor man's pocket. I'm awfully sick and tired of being told that paying wages doesn't create any capital, doesn't create any wealth. The hell it doesn't. Buying Gucci loafers doesn't. The wealthy people in this country are exporting the wealth of this nation. Working class people tend to spend it here. Wealthy people tend to spend it abroad. That's right. Look around. Like I said, the Gucci loafers, I'm not buying any of those. But I wouldn't worry about too much about uh, the state of our educations and whatnot. I'm not a trained economist. Don't want to be. But, uh, you know, there's an old saying I love. It says, you know, the, the one-eyed man is king in the valley of the blind. Whatever that means. <laughs> Well, probably too heavy for me with my poor education and my <laughs> lack of formal education and not being too terribly smart. Oh, I don't know. Of course, I never that. mailed my stamps to anybody. No, no, I'm very careful with my stamps. <laughs> Bob, hang in there. Join talking to you. Be good. Two lines available, one in each county, 9909352. In beautiful tangent. I love that monologue. I mean, I really thought that was neat. I mean, if you guys don't understand what in the hell this is all about, probably because you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. <laughs> Oh, introduce me, Bob. Here's a stereo. Yeah, a stereo airborne traffic report. Well, right at the moment, running uh, in With the Brandon. Harry McFrenry. <laughs> in the Brandon area at Brian. Being discussed this afternoon. Um, the most puzzling aspect of, of what has been discussed this afternoon is why has the working class or the middle class lost sight of what it takes to maintain the common good? Well, I guess because, the, even more importantly, the, the ruling class, if you will, and there is a ruling class in this country, have also done the same thing. Well, I mean, do you, do you want to think that you're, damn, that you're smarter than the people running this place? God, oh, God. no, it's a horrible thought, isn't it? Well, let, let me add this, too. I, I, you're right, and I think there's one other possible answer, uh, and that's that this convoluted theory of trickle-down economics that's sort of been a, an illness working in our economy in the last six years. It's, a, it's an opportunistic theory, and it can only be employed when the working class allows itself to become divided or if the working class becomes self-occupied. Which I think, you know, it, both have happened in this country. The, the division between, you know, working people uh, is frightening. It's to, to see one working man denounce another working man. I, when, a, when, a, when an American worker calls me up and tells me that... You know, American workers' products are crap. Yeah. Uh, whoa, that's scary. Well, what's odd, too, is that it's not necessarily along any kind of racial lines or any oh, no. of the traditional divisions. Hell no, not at all. Uh, these, these were people who were working towards a common goal at one time. Uh, it, it's a new phenomenon, and I don't understand it, because these are the same people who elected Ronald Reagan. You know, my, my detractors can laugh all they want, but when I have a young person call me up in an essence tell me he just doesn't see this place as a family, as a nation, as... You know, anything but a, a free market, that scares the hell out of me. Duncan, i got to run, but thank you, my friend. See you, Bob. On your way home, weekday, 3 to 6, only on News Radio 970, WFLA. 12 minutes after the hour of 5 o'clock. There are two lines available. They are both in uh, where? Hillsborough County, 990 9950 wfla 
Now, I did this incredibly dynamite monologue if you weren't with us at the 3 o'clock hour. You know, I mean, come on. I've done, I've done four really good ones now in the last two weeks. Anyway, I did this really incredibly dynamite monologue. It was funny, poignant, instructive, educational, so forth and so on, based upon this letter that I received that said I was, you know, stupid economically. And, and in essence, what I did is, you know, I went through point by point by point by point. Yeah, so, you know, and, and took care of it and said, you know, maybe you think I'm stupid, too. And in essence, invited people to point out my stupidity. It hasn't turned out that way, but that's okay. Hey, I'm easy to get along with, you know? It's the new improved Lasseter. Nine nine zero nine three five two in Hillsboro. Off it is to uh, Palm Harbor. <laughs> God, sometimes I amuse myself. Hi, Palm. You're on the air at nine seventy WFLA. I agree with you. That letter that you got, it was just ludicrous. I mean, to give the rich people more money just for their televisions, boats, whatever they want, yachts. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think rich people spend an awful lot of money on on their televisions, but. Well, not televisions. Maybe they're uh, Gucci boots or Mercedes. And people are struggling for food and clothes. And these people, they think it'll hurt their economy to feed them and to put some decent clothes on them. Whatever. Thank you so much for the input. Nine nine zero nine three five two in Hillsboro four six one nine three five two in Pinellas. Seminole Heights. Then you're on the air at nine seventy WFLA. Hey, Bob. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, great. Listen, a couple things. Uh, first off, I believe the work ethic in America is strong and thriving. <clears throat> Speaking for myself, uh, I work a full-time job. I'm, I'm one, I guess, on the lower scale here. I work a full-time job of about 54 hours a week. work a part-time job of a little over 20 hours a week to achieve the American dream of having a home. Uh, also, I kind of took a little bit of amusement to what the gentleman said about Ray Kroc. I have a McDonald's across from the store that I run, and it's got a banner hanging up outside of it that says starting wages or, or opening positions starting at three fifty-five an hour. Walked over there, and I, I saw some people taking a picture of the banner. I said, wow, this is kind of neat. McDonald's is not a tourist trap. These folks were from London, and they got such a kick out of that. Oh, really? That Ray Kroc had infused so much, well, a very good job of doing that. I just promised to tell you when, you know, when I catch them, you know, kind of, kind of fritzing on you there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Bob. Thank you much. Have a nice day. Take care. Nine nine zero nine three five two in Hillsboro, where there is a line open. One available in the other place. Four six one nine three five two four six one WFLA. At this particular point, it appears as though Michael Stereo has decided to give up his career as a talented board operator and go into taffy pulling. Uh, at least that... Oh, that's a stretch sign? I thought you were practicing to pull taffy. That means that I'm standing here a few seconds early, but not by many, tap dancing to fill time <clears throat> or Gary McHenry. McHenry, on the other hand, is over there gabbing away on the FM. Why is McHenry gabbing away on the FM? Probably because he thinks that he can get more foxes on the FM. <clears throat> huh. McHenry couldn't get foxes if... if, 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 if I, 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 I had to stretch more. You have to stretch more. In fact, I mean, we can now he's here. late. No, we can't listen. And when oh. I turn on my mic, it mutes the cue. Oh, oh. Cool. Okay. Well, I wonder if he's ready here. yet. Oh, now he's ready. Should we bring him on? Oh, sure, why not? Oh, okay. I'm oh, headed my way. Bummer, a bummer. Zippity doo dah. Zippity doo dah. Is Lassiter ready yet? Gareth, you had always been ready at 520. I had a fox on the phone that wanted to talk to you, man. Are you kidding? No, fox. Liar. Fox calls up and says, Oh, can I talk to Gary? I, I think you're making this Gary's up, Bob. the sexiest man in the whole wide world. He's I think, so in fact, desirable. you but are he, a... Bamber, she bamber, had a bamber. go at 5:20:30. Oh, uh, you're you're full of it. That's what. That's hey, Gar, Gar, you know they're, they're you just you just making me feel bad. Gar, there are fibs and there are fantasies. Talking about a fox calling us to talk to you, man, is a fantasy. Doesn't qualify <laughs> as a fib. <laughs> Fantasies. Gary McHenry with like a, a nice spot, Fox Fetchin WFLA Airborne. Is the traffic, traffic or weather this hour? Or are you uh, doing sports now? 
I'll do um, traffic. Well, airborne sport patrol report. <laughs> Kind of a sport trying to get home without uh, having someone bump into you this afternoon on the interstate. Prices. That's an old... Or a second mortgage or a ninth mortgage. Town and Country Mortgage and Investment Corporation. They, you, you see um, Apple computers are now made outside of the country. I, I I bought one specifically and was very, very disturbed when I opened it up to put a to install a card in it. And it's all made in Taiwan. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. How about Piedmont Airlines? Or home shopping club. <laughs> sir, sir, we're, we're talking about real wealth, not not employers of people at four bucks an hour. Well, I'm not so sure that Piedmont employs people at four bucks an hour, or even home shopping. And and, and home shopping club, sir, you know, basically got its start by importing Capo de Monte yeah. and then passing it along and importing whatever else they could uh, to sell as inexpensively as humanly possible. I'm talking about real wealth industry, sir. You know, genuine wealth, uh, the kind of wealth that we used to create with guys named Ford and. And Carnegie and Firestone and, and Westinghouse. Well, going back just a little more, I got one more shot at you. How about Xerox Corporation? Xerox there wasn't started in the last 25 years. Well, they really came to prominence in the very early 60s. Uh, they started back in 50, but got the presence in, in uh, 60 to 65. And that's stretching it a little, but there has been good examples of... So there are no examples of, of industries that have started in the last... 10, 15, 20 years that have been gigantic good for the country industries. The home shopping network, sir, is not good for the country. It encourages people to, to charge uh, and, and, and literally you know, buy on credit things that they don't need. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's not exactly what I had in mind. It's not exactly what this country needs. We don't need to become uh, a nation of, of home shopping club members, but we sure as hell could use a couple of Firestones and and Fords and a lot of other people that I can think of who, who grew to prominence in this country paying people a decent wage, who grew to prominence in this country basically by employing people who were their customers or who became their customers. Well, I think that you're using them as an idol that uh, is misplaced because I think that the... Well, we better find it. Oh, yeah, those companies got... Uh, I don't know if they paid them uh, living wages when they uh, started out Ford, maybe... Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, Ford sir, had this incredibly wild, bizarre philosophy. Ford loved to be rich. He loved money. He thought it was great. He thought it was neat. And every time he wanted to get more money, Henry Ford did three things. He increased the salaries of his workers. He improved upon his product. And he lowered the price. price. And every single time, he got richer. And he got made more. I, uh, excellent example. Ford is, is an excellent example. We need one of those. I agree with you on that. I just thought that we had a couple that uh, Apple started here and did produce that yes, he did. created great wealth and, and well, you know, uh, both both Jobs and uh, Wozniak are for all practical purposes out of the company. That's correct. But one of them is starting up a new company. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate the call. Nine nine zero nine three five. Who are you? Who are you yelling at, Bob? Oh, I. I there were some foxes downstairs, you know, at the bus stop across the street. Oh, they can't that. hear you. You can't fool me. They can't hear you. That's like insulated glass. They, then, then why, why were you know two of them sticking their their index fingers in their mouths, making strange faces? <laughs> what was that again, Bob? Uh, we're we're coming up on downtown. I'll I'll fly over and check that out. All right. Uh, uh, Gary McHenry with uh, an airborne WFLA downtown traffic report. Why don't you just hold up a poster of me? We don't have any posters of you. You don't? No. How about a Polaroid? No, the last one, uh, Mistako made a little paper airplane out of it and <laughs> sailed it out the door. You couldn't even recognize me after all the dart holes in it either. I noticed that. Well, you know, win some, lose some. I guess. Hi, gee, uh, what's up? Nothing. Hey, uh, let, let, let's do it like a couple of, you know, radio people would. Uh, radio professionals? Uh, hey, Gar, how's the traffic look going home? Well, Bob, you can count on some real delays, especially... Hey, Bob, how are you doing? Magnificent last year. Fine, thank you. Well, thank, uh, thank you for putting me on. Uh, I've been listening to your program, and I'm one of these blue-collar guys that uh, I guess is in the... Uh, um, uh, picture tonight, and uh, I wouldn't be... Opportunity ...to do the best with that we can in this country, but unfortunately from time to time, and at least uh, in certain ways, there are there are people who would keep you from doing the best that That's you can. Exactly there are people true. who would 
discourage you from doing the best that you can? You know, I've I've worked. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough to. Uh, I scraped together enough money years and years ago to be able to buy my own truck. And I had one truck. I had an old truck. I started out with. I really understand it. But uh, you had mentioned a few moments ago that uh, you know you see people who aren't making it, and that bothers you. Well, yeah, it bothers me too. But you know what bothers me even more than the fact that they're not making it? What's that, sir? They can't afford to employ you and your services. That's true. That's true. Uh, um, <laughs> there's, there's. It, it, it could be well for me. It could be well for a doctor. Uh, be well for uh, uh, any anything. Another... Sure it is. Hey, it's more people that can afford to go to Cobb's Cove. Sure. So that they'll, you know, be even happier with me and advertise more and on and on and on well, and on. Well, sure. And on like uh, you know, it, 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 it. People who who are short sighted. And, and, and look at just one sector of an economy and, and, and neg ignore all the rest are going to be the people that when uh, the bad times come, and they will come, there will be sooner or later, there will be bad times. Like the ever popular Dread Web. Uh, uh, Web, do you, do, you, do you talk sports at six or do you, do you talk to sports at six? Whatever. Uh, he'll have on the ever popular Hilda Bumgarten. And Melissa Schwartz, a couple of uh, female mud wrestler, mud wrestlers from the Ula La. They live or uh, in stu uh, phoners or in studio? Mud wrestlers tonight on the phone. Okay, sure. That's what I tell my wife too. Val Rico, hi. You're on the air at 970 WFLA. Hi, Val. Hi. How you doing? Oh, um, fantastic. Uh, Listen to your story today, and, and uh, very interesting. The uh, there is one company I can mention to you that in the last 15 years has made a difference and has done something similar to the, uh, you mentioned the Carnegie's and those types of people, and it's a company that's dealt with the industry that probably has hurt the, the consumer the most, which is the financial services industry. And it's a company called A.L. Williams. You may or may not have heard of them, but they don't advertise, but they have, by word of mouth, uh, attacked the largest industry in the world, the financial services industry. and. Uh, basically, it's showing people that the insurance industry is getting well, that, away. That's with great, sir. How many hundreds of thousands or millions of people do they employ? Okay, we employ over 200,000 people right now. We offer part-time opportunities. Uh, doesn't matter what your background is. You don't have to have a college education. You can learn. <laughs> and why do you laugh? Sorry, because you're pulling my leg. Let's go to uh, Tampa. What the hell? You're on there at 970 WFLA. I think. Yeah, Bob. Uh, yeah. The thing that ilks me is when President Bush comes out and he says he's saving uh, low-income jobs by vetoing the uh, minimum wage bill, and he's making himself out to be the savior of uh, low-income uh, Americans by uh, vetoing the bill. It's just something ironic about that. Well, wait a second. I thought hardly nobody worked for minimum wage in this country. Yeah. And, uh, well, I'm going to be saving a whole lot of jobs if there are hardly any jobs to start with. That's, yeah, and also, uh, they, uh, the small well, businesses, un sense. don't they uh, have to employ a certain amount of people or even be uh, um, required to pay minimum wage? No, sir. I didn't. It, I thought it used to be that way. No. Well, anyway, it, this kind of loves me the wrong way that he's saying he's saving uh, low-income jobs. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, be good. Tampa, you're only here at 970. Oh, pity poo. Oh, darn. I mean, two of them. The last two just dropped off. The last minute to become members of the dog meat club. Gee willikers. I, I, am, I personally am disappointed because obviously the monologue asked people to point out my, you know, my economic stupidity like the, the person who wrote the letter tried to do, and, and that's if you weren't around at 3 o'clock. Of course, you have no idea what I'm talking My God, did you miss a funny monologue. Oh, I loved it. Just absolutely loved it. I'm going to tape it and go home and listen to it three or four times tonight. I, I you know, unlike you, do not get the benefit as a general rule of thumb of listening to myself, and which is you know, one of the great deprivations of my life. Uh, that's usually why I'm, I'm, I'm so grumpy and mean is because, you know, unlike you, I, I can't hear myself. I have to work during these hours. My wife, of course, uh, listens and usually tries to squeeze in the show in between soap operas, which she's probably watching one right now. She was out gallivanting around this afternoon with one of her girlfriends, having lunch, things like that. Probably sitting there right now, you know, saying, oh boy, watch soap opera on the VCR. I think I should take the VCR away from her, force her to listen like you people have to do.